Hey there folks and welcome back to the Tower Tech. In this video I'm going to be doing you a basic guide to overclocking Threadripper, specifically the Acer Zenith Extreme, which is a fantastic board that has an absolute myriad of overclocking options available on it, far more than even the most seasoned LN2 overclocker would actually need, combined with the top of the line Threadripper CPU, the 1950X. This video is going to be a two-parter, I think. This one being the basic settings that I used that, able, that enabled me to get Threadripper very easily and very quickly up to 4 gigahertz on all 16 cores, all 32 threads. And then leave your thoughts, please, down in the comments below. Would you like me to do a more advanced video where we really start to delve into some of the more exotic settings that you can do to minimize your voltage for your overclock and absolutely maximize the voltage uh, maximize the overclock that's available to you on the CPU. So let me know if you want to see that video down in the comments below. Without further ado, let's jump into it and let's get into the settings. So when you first get into BIOS, which you'll do by rapidly and ferociously tapping delete while your system is starting to boot up, for the Zenith board, you're going to get a screen that looks like this. Now this, this is the easy mode and you're going to want to get yourself into the advanced mode, which you're going to do by clicking down on the button down here. That is then going to give us quite a bit more options in terms of our overclock. And you can see you've got a set of menus across the top. And the one that you're going to want to go into is the Extreme Tweaker. I do recommend that you use the latest version of the BIOS, which you can just see here. The latest released version for the Acer Zenith board is 0701. I'm using a beta version, which is 0801. Use that, of course, at your own risk. I personally found it slightly more stable than 0701, albeit it is a beta release, so it conceivably still has some bugs. So we take ourselves into the extreme tweaker. So in the spirit of trying to keep this video a little bit more succinct than some of my other overclocking videos have been, I'm not going to take you through all of these settings and show the process of stability testing. You need to take that as red, guys. Every board and every CPU is slightly unique. The settings that have worked for me are not going to necessarily work for you. I recommend that you start slowly and that you build these up incrementally, little by little by little, and that you do at least a sort of 20 or 30 minute stability test whilst you crank in your, uh, your voltages and your CPU uh, clock speeds. Remembering, of course, the more voltage that you put through your CPU, the hotter it's going to get. Your cooling solution is going to play a very important role. You're going to get very materially different performance from something like that, where you've got a custom loop and a 480 rad in the top versus an all-in-one cooler that has potentially just one 120 mil fan or two 120 mil fans. So, you know, if you're using an all-in-one, I try to stick around the 1.35 volts max. If you've got something very sophisticated like that, then you can potentially go up to 1.4, potentially even 1.45, but you really are going to start to pump quite a bit of additional heat in there. So little by little, and you want to reach the lowest possible voltage on your CPU that is stable for the overclock that you're trying to reach. That will uh, it will maximize the uh, the lifespan of the CPU, and it will make sure that you're not pumping more heat out than your cooling solution is able to cope with. And when you go into here, the overclock tuner is probably going to be set to auto. You have two other settings on this board. You have manual and you have DOCP. Now, DOCP is the AMD equivalent of XMP on Intel motherboard. So that allows you to automatically overclock your memory. I've personally found that that hasn't worked fantastically well for me. It's done all sorts of strange things 
with the uh, the B clock frequency and move that up from 100 to 102, I think. Anyway, long story short, it didn't work for me. And what I've personally found works a little bit better is dialing in those memory voltages and speeds and latency timings manually. I've got far better results doing that. Uh, XMP is an Intel proprietary technology, so AMD would have had to have licensed that from Intel if they wanted to use it on Threadripper, and there would have been a cost involved in doing that, which they obviously didn't want to incur. So uh, you do have the DOCP option. I know that's worked perfectly well for many people, but personally, I found it a bit of a headache. B clock. Some people like to overclock with B-clock, particularly when you're really starting to crank out the very last incremental 100 megahertz or so overclock on your CPU. There can be some value in uh, dialing in higher than 100. 100 is the standard base clock frequency. You've got to remember that that doesn't just control your CPU. That controls many of the speeds of many different components, including things like the PCIe bus. And you can start to get some peculiar performance on things like your GPUs, etc. if you start fiddling with that. So I, I like to leave that as a last tweak, just to crank out the last last opportunities of uh, overclock. And this Asus board doesn't just let you dial in your CPU frequency directly, which I find a little bit frustrating. It has this funky calculation, which you can see uh, described down here. So that's two times FID divided by DID. This is where you wish you paid more attention in maths at school. The good news is, guys, as you dial these uh, you dial these numbers in at the top here, this number will actually start to change. Let me show you if I change that to 170, you can see that the CPU speed has gone up to 4,250 megahertz. I know that won't be stable, so we'll dial that back down to 160 over 8. And again, if we increase that, you can see because it's being divided by that number that that drops down again as well. So I've elected for 160 over eight, which gives me four gigahertz. And you should realistically be expecting to hit at least four gigahertz on the Threadripper, both the 1920X and the 1950X. There's absolutely no reason to think that you won't, you, you, you really lost out bad on the Silicon Lottery. It is conceivable that you might get stuck at 3.9, but given that I managed to get the very basic uh, Ryzen 7 1700 up to 3.9, and it's effectively the same architecture, these are binned cores. You should be able to hit 4 gigahertz relatively comfortably. Overclocking enhancement, no surprises there. You're going to want that switched on. Performance bias, that's to do with performance in particular benchmarks. You shouldn't really need to mess around with that too much. Now, memory frequency. Your memory will be rated to a particular frequency and you'll be very used, particularly if you've been on the Intel platform of dialing in XMP settings. Do make sure that you've had a look at the qualified vendor list for your motherboard to make sure that your memory is compatible. Ryzen architecture is super picky and super temperamental and you could potentially run into some problems. My memory is actually rated for 3000 megahertz. I can't get it above 2800. I've done everything that I can think of. I suspect we are waiting for a BIOS update and there is a disclaimer in the QVL for the Zenith board, as I'm sure there is for many of the other manufacturers, that um, memory might run at lower than the rated speed. It's uh, tested on an Intel platform predominantly, uh, and there are particular G skill memory modules that are explicitly for Threadripper. I think that's the X series, um, but generally speaking, you'll find that memory has been designed with the Intel platform in mind. Hopefully, we're going to start to see that changing with the insurgence of uh, good uh, AMD CPUs. Anyway, I digress. Uh, core performance boosts leave to uh, disabled and SMT auto. Now, spread spectrum is something that you want to disable. Spread spectrum is about reducing electrical noise and interference 
interference as it's piping information around the CPU. And it literally does what it says. It, it extends the bandwidth that particular signals are using. It's not especially helpful for overclocking and I recommend that you disable that, make that one of the first things that you do. EPU power saving mode, again, disabled, not helpful for overclocking. And your DRAM timing control, this is where you're gonna want to go in and dial in all of your latencies. Uh, if you don't know what the latencies are for your CPU and you're struggling to find them, there's a handy tool on this board that if you go to Asus SPD information, you can look up all of the XMP profiles for your memory. Don't worry too much about the sub-timings over here. These are the timings that you're most interested in. Quickly jot those down and then you can go back into the extreme tweaker and you can dial them in. Very handy information to have. Uh, external Digi power control, we're gonna leave for now. This is the exotic settings that I was describing earlier and this is where you've got opportunity to really dial stuff in. CPU voltage, you're gonna spend quite a lot of your time uh, tweaking around with this. Again, when you start, you're gonna find yourself an auto. You want to go to your uh, manual mode and you want to start to dial your voltage in here. You will potentially notice a slight difference from the voltage that you've dialed in. So this is at 1.375 volts. And actually, if we go across here, you can see that's at one point. Well, it's fluctuating between 1.373 and 1.395 volts. That's to do with uh, load line calibration, which we will leave for a conversation the another day day. CPU sock voltage, it can be helpful to increase your sock voltage if you're having problems with your memory overclock. Uh, definitely try to go no higher than 1.3. It's a very quick way to fry your board if you mess around with that too much and don't know what you're doing. Uh, just on CPU core voltage before I move on from that, I've described to that already guys, this is very dependent on the cooling solution that you've got in your system. Don't go mad, start low. That said, I did find under auto, particularly with some of the older versions of the BIOS, it was doing some crazy, crazy stuff and that was bouncing, uh, that was bouncing all over the place. Uh, DRAM voltage, you will want to set whatever your uh, your memory is rated at, mine's 1.35. Again, that should be available on manufacturer's website or the packaging. All of the rest of these, you really should be leaving alone. This is a fairly basic overclock. And just by way of a reminder, guys, don't go straight to four gigahertz. I know that this is good. I've input this already. I know these settings work. They aren't necessarily going to work for, for you. You know, I recommend that you start at 3.8 on the lowest voltage that you can, probably something around 1.3 volts is a good place to start. And then just dial that in uh, increments of 100 megahertz. So, you know, start at 3.7, go to 3.8, go to 3.9. The second that you have problems booting into Windows, then uh, you need to apply a little bit more voltage. I do recommend that you do a 20 minute stability test, which I will show you how to do in a moment. A setting that I recommend that you disable is something called C-States. C-States is all about power saving idle. Now that can impact your overclock because the voltage can't adjust quickly enough once you put load onto the CPU. It's fine under stock conditions, but you're gonna to start to have problems as you, particularly as you start to push the threshold of your CPU. You can find that in advanced under AMD CBS, Zen common options. You can find global C state control, I recommend that you disable that. It should be enabled by default. Again, a bit like spread spectrum, I recommend that you make that one of the first things that you do. So, 
we F10. It's telling us we've not made any changes, but in your case, it will tell you that you have made some changes. OK that and boot into Windows. So to do my stability testing, I use a program called Ada64. You can get 30 day free trial. I've personally chosen to purchase it. I build multiple systems and the license can be moved between the systems, which is quite handy. Let me just dial that down a little bit so you can see that a little bit more clearly. So there's a whole set of different features on this bit of software that allows you to gain information about your system, about your motherboard, etc. For the purposes of what we're doing, you want to go to tools, you want to go to system stability test. Generally, I leave all of these settings well alone and I hit start. And you're able on here to monitor the temperature of your CPU, which I recommend that you do keep an eye on. It's worth noting, however, that there, this version of ADA64 does incorrectly report the temperature of Threadripper. So if you have a look here, that's currently reporting a CPU temperature of 33 degrees C, which given it's under 100% load, as much as I would like to think my water cooling skills are that damn good, uh, they ain't. Because actually, if you come across and have a look here, let me open the side of the case so it's a little bit easier for you to see and get the angle. You can see quite clearly that's sitting at 62 degrees. So, particularly for Threadripper, I do recommend that you are a little bit cautious. I recommend doing 20 to 30 minute tests in between each increment, which feels a little bit painful, granted, but you are going for stability. Once you've got to an overclock that you're happy with, let's presume for the purpose of this video that it's a two, uh, it's a two, it's a four gigahertz overclock that you're after, you are going to want to run the stability test for a good couple of hours. Now for gaming system, I think two to three hours is perfectly adequate. If you are a heavy workstation user then you're probably going to want to go for maybe four or five hours i do know people that run these for 12 24 hours uh, you can do that if you want i think you're going to find out just through general day-to-day -day usage if you've got an unstable overclock anyway and i just don't want to be without the system for that length of time if you do find later on after running a three or four hour stability test that uh, the system is doing some odd things just go back into the BIOS and just add very very small increment of additional voltage you can use the plus and minus keys on the numpad just to incrementally increase that voltage that saves you making a mistake when you're dialing when you're dialing in voltages manually so of course my health warning for all of this guys is you do this at your own risk if you stay within some sensible voltages and it's it's heat specifically is the enemy of electronics adding more voltage in directly correlates to more heat make sure that you take account of the cooling solution that you've got in your pc and that you're sensible with the voltages that you apply do that in small increments stay for all-in-one coolers around about the 1.35 core voltage certainly no more than 1.4 if you've got a more exotic water cooling system then the chances are that you're probably not watching this video anyway because you're slightly more advanced but if you are watching this video 1.45 i think is the absolute maximum that i would go to and i would be a little bit reluctant to leave that uh, that for general everyday use you potentially shorten the life expectancy of your cpu so that just about wraps it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Please like and share this video. I hope you're really well wherever in the world you are. And I'll see you in my next one.